I know I missed some people, but there'll be a panel uh, uh, at the end, so you can ask your question then. Um, so, thank you. So next off, we have uh, Professor Francesca Rossi. Uh, she uh, teaches at University of Padova and is a computer scientist. Uh, she's the president of the International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence and is associate editor-in-chief of the Journal of Artificial Intelligence Research. And today she's going to talk about ethical embodied decision making. Welcome. So yeah, so the point that I want to make with this talk uh, is that uh, in order to help people make a very good decision close to optimality, we need to have both these features. We need to um, help them in an embodied environment, and I will explain a little bit what I mean by that. And we also need to make sure that uh, the process of decision making and also uh, the result of the decision-making process is going to follow some ethical principles. So in order to uh, talk about this, I will start from uh, a document that has been uh, uh, published very recently, two days ago, from uh, the White House. Uh, it's a document that describes the strategic plan for uh, AI. And uh, it contains uh, uh, the description of the goal of the strategic plan. And the goal is to produce AI which is beneficial to society while minimizing the negative effect. And I think that this is the goal of many of the events that we have all been participating and many of the initiatives, uh, included including the in partnership initiative that I'm part of that was mentioned before and that I will come back to it later on. So I think we can all share that goal. And to achieve that goal, uh, this document describes uh, seven uh, lines of, uh, uh, seven directions, seven strategies. One is uh, related especially to a funding agents like a government should be, which is to have long-term investments in AI research because we need to understand not just uh, the short-term implications and results that we can get, but we also need to think as have many people have mentioned today, we also need to think at the impact in the long term. Uh, another one is the issue of human AI collaboration. So uh, it has to do you know, with the fact that AI systems will work with us, together with us, in the environment in which we function. And I will get back to that. The third one is to try to understand also the ethical, legal, and societal implication of the use of AI system, including how to make them aligned in terms of values and ethics to our values, human values and ethical principles. Then, you know, the fourth one has to do with building AI systems that are safe and secure in the sense of that they can be reliable in our eyes, they can be dependable, we can have trust into these AI systems because otherwise we would not be able to relate well in, uh, to them if we not trust them. And the fifth one has to do with you know, doing things in the open. A lot of um, uh, many successful AI approaches, especially those based on machine learning, uh, we know that are, depend a lot of the data that is used to train those systems. So it's important as these data sets are uh, public and available and known also to build that trust that I mentioned before. The sixth one has to do with, you know, evaluate how we are going to evaluate AI and assess the real, you know, capabilities of an AI system. And the seventh one, of course, is the implication onto the workforce. And in this talk, I will mainly uh, touch upon these uh, uh, three, three strategies in the middle, so I will uh, describe and stress a lot the issue of human AI collaboration more than the autonomous AI, which of course uh, has a lot of value, but in this talk I will mostly uh, talk about human AI collaboration. Uh, the 
ethical uh, and legal and uh, uh, societal implication of AI and how to embed these ethical principles uh, or questions about how to embed these ethical principles, I don't have many answers, of course, uh, into these uh, um, um, AI systems uh, that collaborate with humans and then how to build trust into these systems. So let's start with human AI collaboration. So the idea here is that the focus is on systems that uh, are not going to uh, replace our intelligence, but are going to actually augment our intelligence. So in terms of decision making, which is the area that I've been work for many years uh, in the past, the idea is not to make decisions uh, instead of humans making decisions, but to help humans make better decisions. And this can be done when a single individual has to make a decision. We're going to help that single individual to make a better decision, whatever it is that is doing, whether in his private life or professional life, or also helping a group of people to make decisions, which is a bit more complex task. And of course, in order to do that, you have to put together a system which is not just a human, it's not just an AI system, but is a human and AI system, or a group of humans and AI systems together. And uh, as you see here, that's a typical e example that is given that in many scenarios, for example, in chess, people say that most of the time, you know, now it's recognized that humans plus machines playing chess play better than the human alone and the, or, the, or the AI system alone, but also in more you know, useful applications like diagnosing cancer, it has been seen that the error, which can be small in both the human alone or the uh, AI system alone, but if you put them together, it becomes even smaller. This means that human and machines are really complementary in their limitations, so they can help each other in really achieving a better performance in terms of for example, diagnosing cancer in this way. So um, uh, I really think there is a lot of uh, um, um, interest, I mean, uh, from society, a lot of uh, beneficial implication in uh, trying to focus not only on this, but trying to, you know, understand how to make in the best way these human-machine collaborative systems. And, of course, to have a natural and effective interaction, of course, we need to understand what it means, you know, to, for this human and machine to work together. And we need to understand how to model the human, how to elicit his preferences, his opinions, its desires, what is... Goal, the goal that he has to do. Uh, we need to be able to have awareness from the AI system of the context in which the human is functioning, and the context not just in a static way, but also over time, remembering what was done in the past and how decisions were made and what the implications of the decision consequences has been so that we can improve over time. We, we want systems that are proactive, uh, proactively uh, providing information to the human and not just on request because they can help much better in that way. They can alert when things are not going well. For example, on the ethical side, they can alert humans and help them being, for example, more ethical. Now I'm uh, anticipating going to, to the ethical side, but of course, humans, you know that we have all our ethical principles. We may have all our ethical principles, but sometimes we are a bit confused and we don't follow them just because, you know, things are rewarded or redefined in a different way. So definitely there is a way for a human AI collaboration here. And also they have to be able to sense our emotions, our, you know, way of moods, you know, our way of functioning that particular day in that particular context. So they have to have some sort of emotional intelligence and they have to be able to interact with us in a very natural way. So real time, dialogue, interaction, natural language and pro processing and so on. So this is the desiderata, I think, of a human AI collaborative system. And I claim that this desiderata can be, of course, we can try to implement this desiderata into an app, into our phone, or into a system that we can open the laptop and use it. But actually, I think the future is not of people opening a laptop and using a tool, or people using an app in, on, on my phone. It's of people walking around 
in whatever environment they are, and that environment recognizes them, remembers their uh, uh, preferences and opinions, uh, and uh, uh, observes what the humans do, sees if he needs help in whatever task is a approaching in that, in that particular context and provides information and helps this human make decisions. So I think the best way to help people make better decisions is within embodied environment. And uh, the environment, of course, uh, uh, the fact that you have an embodied environment is that the environment is always with you. Wherever you go, the environment follows. And of course, it is related to the Internet of Things thing, where everything will be um, linked to each other. So you are not going to close a little laptop somewhere and then open it somewhere else, and then you have to say, oh, by the way, these things happened in the meantime, and then you need to remember this because this is going to affect my next decision. But you, the information will always be there with you. And there are also going to be situations like a surgery room or a cockpit of a, of a plane in an emergency situation. So you, you humans are already in embodied environment all the time during their private or professional life. So it would be uh, not reasonable to not exploit this or embodied environment that are already there, especially when you need the real-time decision in a very fast time and with you know, critical results and consequences. So the environment should be able to see and listen to the human, you know, so perception capabilities, remember, you know, having memory, remember all the past actions and decisions, collect the human preferences in a dynamic way, and possibly not just monotonic and accumulating, but resolving conflicts, because human can change their preferences of opinion over time, and then uh, exploit, uh, I think that the embodied the uh, features on the environment could really be exploited to have a better natural interaction. For example, we know that dialogue, natural language dialogue between a human and a system is not really uh, at a very advanced level. Question answering is, but dialogue is not really, we cannot really dialogue, meaning, you know, several questions one after the other without having to repeat the contest from scratch all the time. So the dialogue capabilities, I think, would be much um, uh, supported and helped and improved by having an embodied environment. Because, for example, if this room were, you know, a, a, an embodied environment where, you know, with cameras, that I can see where I am, what I say, where I look at, where I point, then some um, uh, pronoun resolution, for example, that are not easy, that would be easier by just looking at where I point and where I look at. Okay? So the information in this avoided environment where humans will have will be helped in making decision will flow in two different directions. From the environment, which is going to provide, you know, uh, to provide data in the right way, uh, format for human to understand, is going to provide suggestions for possible decision, is going to provide capabilities for resolving conflicts if it's a group decision making, like a hiring committee. So flows of information will go from the environment to the humans, but also information will go from the humans to the environment by providing, you know, with my gesture, with what I say, it will collect my preferences and will be used during the decision that I have to make now, today, but also tomorrow, because it will be remembered over time. So now let's go to the other, um, uh, the other objective that I use, which is about ethics. And of course, we don't want just humans to make better decisions where better means more efficient or more uh, um, operationally more uh, uh, close to optimality. But we want it to be um, decisions that are going to be aligned with our ethical principles. And, uh, and um, when, I, when I say ethical principles, uh, it's I know it's a very vague word, and probably I use it in a wrong way because I'm not a philosopher, but I mean a very uh, wide set of things going from the ethical principles that philosophers talk about to moral values and so on, but also to some social norms, to some behavioral rules that we usually follow in a certain context, or even professional codes laws, traditions, cultural-based uh, behaviors that we have, you know, maybe, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, 
So I mean many different things that uh, then will be, will be specific, then will be specialized and uh, in particular contexts and when I'm doing one particular task. And so it's important, of course, that these principles are not just stuck into the system at the end, when the system of decision support system is already uh, constructed, but they should be there since the beginning of the design phase. So there is this you know, engineering part uh, that, uh, of AI safety that should be really part of the whole process from the, the, the initial design of the decision support system to the end when the thing is actually deployed to the real world. Um, we know that uh, it's not that clear yet how to embed ethical principles into these systems. Uh, of course, it would be very nice if we could write some rules, well-defined rules, and then once we have rules, uh, as was mentioned before, of course we can Co computationally write these rules in a way that uh, a program can, you know, a language can describe and then we can implement them and so on and then uh, the system can follow the rules. But most of the time it's not like that. First of all, because rules can make change and also because we don't have rules, but as mentioned before, we have mostly principles. Like take a a doctor, a doctor has to follow the Hippocratic oath when he makes decisions. But the Hippocratic oath is very vague. Many things are not said, and so we don't have a set of rules that the doctor has to obey every single minute of his uh, professional life. Um, it is, uh, of course, uh, um, possible then to say, okay, I don't have rules, so then let's look at the doctor. Let's look at the way it works. Let's look at the way he makes decisions over time. And then I will learn more or less these principles and rules by observing the doctor, you know, like an, in an inverse reinforcement learning idea. And this is also, you know, a, a possible approach, but I mostly think that the two approaches should be combined because sometimes you have some rules maybe with a lot of holes here and there, and then you can fill the gaps in that. But I think that this is not enough, and what is needed is also something that we, we yet don't know how to describe, which is common sense. And as uh, also Ian mentioned before, you know, we do many things and we predict many things of behavior of other people because we have, you know, we know how the world works. We have common sense reasoning inside during our, you know, years, several years of life. We have built this common sense reasoning inside us and nobody gave us some rules, but we just build them by observing others, by looking at the consequences of our actions and by doing many, many methods to um, uh, acquire this common sense and we still don't know how to put machines uh, how to put it into machines so two different doctors but following the Hippocratic Court principles, they may be behaving in very different ways, given the same patient with the same history, just because you know, they have maybe different uh, ways of implementing the Hippocratic Oath into their real life you know, professional decisions. It may also depend on where they are, maybe a doctor in Europe will behave different than a doctor in, in the United States. You know? So there are many different dimensions along which that make this task complex, um, but mostly in this uh, um, AI, uh, human collaborative system that I'm talking about, uh, this uh, ethical, you know, we need to make sure that really there is value alignment. And the reason why we want to do that is because we want to trust these systems. If we don't trust this system, if we not trust them at the right level of trust, then we are going to have a very, you know, uh, non-optimal results. We don't want to over-trust the system, of course, because otherwise we are going to expect some good behavior when the system does not have the capability to, to, to perform that way. But we don't want even to under-trust the system because otherwise we won't be able to exploit the full capabilities of what the system can give us in terms of helping us make decisions. So building trust is very important and is not something, again, that is static. Even between humans, you don't build trust just the first time you meet somebody. You build trust over time by looking 
looking at how that person behaves, whether it's reliable, whether you can explain why he's doing something and why he's not doing something. And in this case, if it's not making decision, suppose that the AI system is not making decision, but you're suggesting decision, it has to tell me why are you suggesting that therapy with that patient and not another one that I would suggest. Maybe you have read more you know, text, uh, you know, in uh, uh, scientific articles, then you tell me which, which is the article that is going to, you know, explain why you're doing that. And so the role of explanation is really very important. And possibly over time, when we interact with this AI system, over time possibly the explanations will be less and less important. Because once you build trust, then you understand that the system behaves according to certain principles. And possibly at the beginning, you may want a lot of explanations. And then over time, we will, we will just trust by requiring very little information behind the decision that is uh, suggesting you to do. Um, there is a lot of emphasis on explanations, especially on uh, domains where uh, uh, domains where uh, you have some liability, like in the healthcare domain, or where there is liability, meaning that you know the system, the, the system human plus machine, or the human, if it's the one, is going to be liable. It has to explain why it, it did something. And as you know, in Europe, there recently was the regulation that said that by 2018, every system that is going to make decision who's, that significantly affect the life of some human, it has to provide explanations why that decision was made. Of course, explanation uh, can, be, can mean everything and nothing. You, know, you want explanations that are understandable to the target users. If it has to explain to the, to the patient, uh, if you are in an healthcare domain, it's one thing. It has, it has to explain to the doctor, it's another thing. If it has to explain to the person who developed the system, it's another thing. So, of course, explanation may mean def different things. But again, I think this is true for some people think that this business of building trust uh, and explanation is mostly to do with autonomous systems. But I really think it has a lot to do also, and especially with human-machine collaboration, because in that uh, symbiosis of human and machines is where you, know, you want a very effective and seamless teamwork. And without trusting each other, you will not be able to get that. So um, the ethical embodied decision-making, putting all these ingredients together, is what uh, I think is the vision for the future, the intersection of these three areas, decision-making, AI ethics, and embodied cognitive systems. But in fact, you need research in any of the two uh, sub-areas of two things alone. So you need et research on ethics in decision systems, which values, how you represent the values. For example, in this area, uh, we have I've worked with other people in this room and also many others have worked on this in uh, knowledge representation. Decision making is mostly based on preferences of individuals and groups. So we want to understand whether these uh, models of preferences that people have developed in AI for many years, they can be also adapted and reused also for expressing ethical theories because ethical theories uh, after all, they are defining more or less the same way the preferences are defining, which is a partial or a total order over the possible uh, decision that one can make. Uh, and uh, we also have to work on, of course, embodied decision making, so interaction in an embodied environment. And I didn't write that, but possibly there is also work to do in AI ethics and the body cognitive system without even thinking of decision making. But in general, I think it's a very multifaceted approach where besides the technological part and the AI experts part, uh, we need to talk also in a very multidisciplinary environment. I will skip the part on the preferences and more details, but I can give the slides um, if it's uh, useful. And then I will just finish with some of the initiatives that are ongoing and they may be related to this event and also to what we have been talking today. So uh, this uh, um, Ethical, uh, how, uh, embedding ethical principles in decision support systems is also a subject of um, a project that I am doing together with other people uh, funded by the Future of Life Institute. And of course, in that project, uh, we focus on collective decision making, so helping people make decision. Uh, and we don't focus that much on embodied, so we are working in the top part of that uh, picture that I showed you. But there are really a lot of interesting uh, issues and ideas there. So it's really an area of 
a lot of scientific advance and very promising. The second one is an IEEE global initiative. IEEE, you know, is a very large um, association of engineers and developers all over the world, and they're really interested into the issues that we are interested in today, all of us. And they are planning to you know, think about standards for uh, designing uh, systems that, uh, build, uh, that process ethical values and so on. Um, Another thing is the company that I joined, IBM. I joined IBM one year ago, and I brought this interest into ethics into the company, and I think that the company supported that very much. Of course, IBM is not that it was not doing things ethically before me joining. It has done things you know, in a responsible way for 110 years, but I think that now things are more explicitly handled with various initiatives, uh, white papers, uh, and uh, so on. And, um, and uh, what happened? Oh, sorry. Uh, the last thing is the partnership on AI. So the partnership on AI, as I mentioned before, is an initiative that was launched uh, um, two weeks ago, maybe, uh, with five companies um, that uh, put together their interest into developing and deploying AI in the most beneficial way for people and society. That's the name, partnership of AI to benefit people and society. And uh, the founders are five companies, but actually it is going to be open to everybody, non-corporate environments of any kind, as scientific associations, professional associations, um, uh, other companies that actually don't do AI, but deploy AI to the real world, for example, or even uh, non-profit uh, organizations uh, and many, many other stakeholders. Uh, everything that comes to mind is invited to come and to discuss uh, these issues of how, what it means to deploy AI in the real world, to develop it in the ethical way, and also to make sure that it behaves ethically when it's deployed in the real world. Great. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you very much for your talk. My name is Carola Kreitmeyer. I'm from Stanford. Um, I, think, I think there might be a little bit of a tension in what you're um, talking about with respect to the embodied environments. And I'm going to try and put this all in one question, although it's sort of two questions. So in this embodied environment, uh, it seems to me, so I wanted to get your input on whether you think there is something lost in this kind of an environment. Because you might think that humans are sort of evolved that we have these adaptive abilities to exist in a natural environment, and that when we transition into this um, embodied environment, that there is maybe either a sense of authenticity that is lost or a, a, some sort of aesthetic value that is lost. And, and the conflict I see with that is, so now I'm transitioning to the second part of my question. Um, your discussion of how we ought to embed sort of not only moral principles, but even social norms in our AI, I think necessarily something like the embodied environment violates social norms because we don't accept it when people stare at us 24 seven and deduce by our little twitches in our faces what it is we're thinking about. So I think, I think there's a tension there that on one side, it sounds like you want to maintain kind of a, a regular human social norm environment, but on the other side, this is a very artificial, you know, it's in the name. Um, <laughs> environment. Thank you. I understand. Yeah, okay. So, um, well, the fact is that uh, to, for the first question, I think, uh, I mean, uh, most of the time we are inside an environment. So I don't feel this environment artificial with the room where we are right now. I don't feel it as artificial because most of the time, I mean, not in a room like that, but either in my office or in a meeting room with other people or in a conference room. So I'm not suggesting to put people in a special, you know, very strange environment, which is all dark and they're, I don't know, they have goggles to look at each other or something. But I, I envision a, 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 a scenario where people are in their own natural environment, natural, however natural you feel is this conference room. Uh, the room is equipped with uh, 
uh, possibly as the least invasive uh, things as possible to actually support those people those individuals to do whatever task they are doing in that environment already. So pilots are already in the cop cockpit of a plane. I'm not building another environment for them, and that's my whole point. I mean, I don't want them to open a laptop when there is a crisis on the, on, on the plane and they need to understand where they do an emergency landing. I want them to, the environment to help them. So I think this is actually more natural than just, you know, having to, you know, use a tool which is separated from the environment. So I, I, I don't see that as... Uh, uh, unnatural, uh, because I want the normal environment to support this decision-making system. And the second part of the question, which has to do with violating social norms, you know, conflict with social norms, again, I think that, uh, you know, um, uh, when uh, I think uh, that there could be that tension if the environment becomes too uh, um, uh, invasive, okay, uh, in order to help more the decision process. So I think that, yes, there could be a way to, you know, uh, to, to draw a line to when the environment is a support to the decision making and when the environment is not, I mean, the support, uh, you know, uh, is, is becoming too much and then the, the people should be, to be able to, you know, to, to use their social norms, including how they interact naturally among them. Hi. Uh, first, I just want to quickly address that point. Games are about suspension of human norms, and it happens all the time. And so creating a game environment in the embodied environment will, I think, bypass that problem. Um, and there's also a question of new social norms being needed, which is about human evolution. So uh, the question I have for you is I heard a focus. Uh, there's self, human self to machine, human few to machine, human many to machine dialogue. And that's the subject of your focus. Now, my question is, is the following also a subject of your focus and your research? Uh, many to many human dialogue, many to self or many to few human dialogue, where the technology, the embodied environment, is facilitating the existing human dialogue rather than the dialogue being between the machine and the human? Yeah, okay, that's a very interesting question. So I think there is a role for machines to help uh, people um, resolve conflicts, possible conflicts in uh, interacting among them. Um, uh, as, as I was mentioning, there is a role for machines to alert humans or groups of humans when there is some deviation with respect to norms of laws or, or ethical principles or professional codes. So in the same way, I think there could be a role in uh, helping them uh, resolve, you know, in interaction glitches, I would say. Yeah. Last question. People are identifying themselves. I'm Francis Cam from Harvard University. Um, I thought it would, might be useful for you to consider the, uh, an issue that some philosophers have focused on, namely, to what extent can one trust and rely on the opinion of a so-called expert uh, when one makes a decision, though one doesn't understand and agree with the expert? So certainly when you hire an accountant or a plumber, okay, uh, you, after a while, you see that their results have been good. You don't know much about it. You don't understand why they're doing this right now, but you go with their view. Mm -hmm. But some people have argued that in the area of ethics, it would be wrong, morally wrong, to trust and rely on what has even been a dependable, trustworthy ethical system in the past. If you still do not agree with that entity, they provide you with an explanation, you don't see why they think that is an explanation. Some people have argued that in the area of ethics in particular, unlike other areas of knowledge, it would be morally wrong to do what you in good conscience do not think is the right thing to do. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if that will affect the degree to which we can rely on, let us say, the ethical expertise, so to speak, of an AI system. There is a whole literature on this, and I, I just helpfully, I hope it will be constructive for yes, people course, to look of at course. it. Of course, I agree that, you know, in the, 
what's important is that the system helping you make a decision maybe alerts you that that decision involves some ethical dilemma and it tells you you know how it explains you why it's suggesting you to make a certain decision because it's following some ethical principles you may not agree and the important thing that you are aware the line of reasoning that 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 uh, uh, AI system is is using in order to suggest you that decision. But the final um, decision maker is the human, and the human is supported in, the, in his decision, even if the decision is different from what, what is suggested by the AI system. But the AI system has helped the human, at least, to, to, uh, to describe, to structure the space of the possible decision and then to suggest something according to the ethical principle that the AI system has. But maybe it's not the same as, maybe not the same social norms or same of the doctor, but the doctor at least has, I think even in that case, it has been helped in making a decision, even if the decision is different from what is suggested. So yeah, I mean, it's very interesting and I would like to see more on that. Great, let's thank Francesca for, for